experience life. How are we? Great to see you here at our Southwest campus. I want to welcome our downtown campus. Glad you guys are joining with us today. Amarillo Campus, Church Online, Network Churches across West Texas. So thankful that you're joining with us today as well. Before we get started, quick announcement. Quick announcement. Next two weekends, you will want to be here. I guarantee you, you will. It's going to be awesome. I mentioned it last weekend. But over the next two weekends, we're going to be showing something that our video team has been working on for like the last four months, producing this thing. It's going to be in DVD format. We're going to be able to sell them and give them to your family members, friends. But basically, it's for celebrating our five-year anniversary. It's a full-length, 60-minute, five-year documentary of Experience Life's history. Doesn't that sound exciting? We're going to show it to you next weekend. And the weekend after, instead of keeping you here all day next weekend, showing you the whole thing, we're going to break it into two parts and show it to you over the next two weekends. But next weekend will be like early days. There's a lot of you guys that would be, you know, probably new to that, hadn't heard that information about how I ended up in seminary and why I was doing computer stuff and transitioned to ministry. And then we started this church and how we got people to come initially and where we met. And I mean, it's just an, it's a fascinating story. And then the week after that will be more current events, things that you've heard about over the last couple of years. So we put it all together. Our video team's worked hard on it. It's awesome. And we can't wait. So next two weekends, be here for that. It's going to be great. But today we are continuing a series we've been in called Awakening, where we've basically just been telling Stories from the Bible and stories in our church of people that have been awakened by God. And we said that can be so encouraging at times because if we feel like we've fallen asleep spiritually, then hearing about other people that God has woken up helps us think, man, maybe God can wake me up as well if I'm asleep and I ask him to. So we've been telling you stories from the Bible and stories in our church, and we're going to do that again today. So if you've got a Bible, Acts chapter 13, page 147 in the blue ones. We have these available at all of our campuses. You can grab one on the way out. Easy to understand translation, and they're free. But it's page 147. I'm just going to tell you this, this story from the Bible, and then I'm going to uh, share with you a couple of verses on the screen here in a second. And then we'll have a video, Eli, for sharing their uh, story on video here in just a little bit. So I'm uh, going to be short and sweet today, which I think everybody likes short and sweet uh, messages. As you guys know, I'm still kind of recovering from the throat surgery that I had, so trying to take it easy, came back strong the first week and blew it out for about a week and a half. And so <laughs> decided, hey, you may need to slow down a little bit. So uh, we're going to get right to it today. Acts 13, page 147, here's what's going down. You got Paul and Barnabas. They are two missionaries sent out of this church at Antioch. Let me show you a map here so you kind of know part of the world I'm talking about. Here's Antioch. This is like modern day Turkey, modern day Syria. Israel down here. So you got Antioch here, Paul and Barnabas from Antioch. They send them out as missionaries to go throughout this area, plant churches, tell people about Jesus, preach the gospel and all that. So they're excited about it. One place they end up on one of their missionary journeys is right out here from Antioch in the island of Cyprus, on the island of Cyprus, which is south of modern day Turkey. It's modern day Turkey, south Cyprus. They're on the island of Cyprus. And they're telling all these people about Jesus and lots of people are being awakened. So they end up in this town right here, Paphos, where the governor lived, the governor of this island. He was a Roman governor. And it, because he was an intelligent Roman governor in that day and age, they would have been interested in talking all the time about all the current philosophies, current religions, things people believe. They were just interested in those kinds of things and spent a lot of their time debating about philosophies and religion. Well, the governor hears... And Paul and Barnabas are going around his country sharing about Jesus and people are being awakened. And so he thinks to himself, hey, if they're in my town, I want to hear from them too. Well, the only problem was one of the governor's close friends, according to Acts 13, was a guy they just called the false prophet. He'd become a close friend of this governor whose name was Sergius Paulus. This is his false prophet. The reason he's probably close friends with a false prophet is because he was interested in the philosophies and religions and teachings of that day. And this guy probably had some unusual things to say. And so they became friends. Well, anyways, he calls for Paul and Barnabas. He wants to hear this message that they have, and the false prophet doesn't like it very much. And he tells the governor, Sergius Paulus, he says, hey, Mr. Sergius Paulus, governor guy, hey, I wouldn't listen to those guys. Paul and Barnabas, those guys are crazy. I, I mean, I, I don't think I spent any time with them. I wouldn't listen to them at all. And he was kind of trying to you know, be an obstacle in the way of Paul and Barnabas sharing the gospel with this governor because the false prophet probably thought, hey, everybody else is being awakened. Maybe the governor's going to be awakened. I'm going to lose my influence. 
with the governor. So Paul, he's watching all this go down. He's hearing this. He did not like at all what this false prophet had to say to the governor. So this is what Paul said to the false prophet. And I guarantee you, he was not happy when he said this. All right, this is what he said. Then he said, you son of the devil. Okay, that's like son of a gun, but it's worse because it's the devil. All right, it's not a gun, it's a devil. He's like, you son of the devil. I mean, so he, he's not happy. You son of the devil. Full of, this is Paul talking to the false prophet. Full of every sort of deceit and fraud and enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be, watch, struck blind. Mr. False Prophet's going, oh, this, this isn't going anywhere good. You will not see the sunlight for some time, so not all his life, but instantly the mist and darkness came over the man's eyes. He began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Now, imagine being there. What do you think the governor was thinking about this time? Sees his friend, this false prophet. He's blinded by God for getting in the way. I'm sure the governor was like, oh, my dang. Oh, my dang. Did that just, did that just happen? Like, Mr. False Prophet, hey, can you see me? I can't see you, man. I can't see anything. I need somebody to help me. I can't see. And, and I'm sure they're freaking out. False Prophet's freaking out because he's blind. The governor's going, who, who are these guys? Like, God threw them, like, blinds the guy. Didn't say, again, for the rest of his life, but just for a time. He was an obstacle the way of this governor trusting in Christ. So he just gets blinded. And I'm sure the co governor was going, maybe I should listen pretty closely to what these guys are fixing to tell me, like maybe, maybe they are from God and maybe that means that they know the truth about God. Because the governor would have thought, you know, I spent a lot of time arguing with people, debating about God and, you know, philosophies and all this. But these guys with this miracle and all, they seem to maybe be from God. So maybe this is what I've been hoping somebody would tell me all of my life. So God removes this false prophet who's an obstacle. Paul and Barnabas share with this guy. Look what happens next. This isn't going to surprise you. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer. I imagine so. I mean, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So he sees this miracle. He's blown away. He's thinking, these guys must be from God. Then he hears the teaching about Jesus, the gospel, and he's like, I'm in. Like I, I want, like, I want that. Like, I've been looking for that all my life. I've been searching for God, for truth, trying to figure it out. We got, like, a whole pantheon of gods in, you know, Rome. So I'm trying to figure it all out. And I think what you're saying is true. And he became a believer like the governor of that little island of Cyprus. God woke him up the first time in his life. Can you imagine how his life was changed, being awakened by God? Imagine what his country thought, all the people that knew him. He starts talking about Jesus and telling everybody about Jesus. Maybe all kinds of people that didn't come to Jesus under Paul and Barnabas' ministry started coming to Jesus because he was telling them about Jesus. I mean, his life was totally changed. He became a believer. He saw the miracle. He heard the teaching. He said, I want that. If God can awaken me, I want him to awaken me. And he did. And he did. Short story, but powerful story. And here's what I think it communicates to us today. I think this is a simple takeaway from this story. It's this. That God can remove whatever obstacle is in your way that's keeping you from committing your life to his son. He can remove the obstacles. He can remove whatever obstacle is in one of your friend's ways keeping them from committing their lives to Christ. He can remove that obstacle. He can remove the obstacle that's in one of your family members' ways that's keeping them from committing their life to Christ. He's in the business of removing obstacles that are keeping people from committing their lives to Christ, just like he did with the false prophet. He removed the obstacle. Now let's talk about some obstacles that people face these days. Tell me if some of these aren't true. Is this not an obstacle that a lot of people struggle with these days, coming to faith in Christ? Intellectual doubt. It is, right? I mean, because people have questions. They're like, well, see, here's the thing. I'm not going to become a follower of Jesus. I'm not going to let God wake me up because I got doubts about God and Jesus. Like, how... Come on, come on, come on. You're saying somebody was really born of a virgin? No, that doesn't happen. You're saying somebody really came back from the dead? That doesn't happen. You're saying, you're saying this Jesus guy is the only way to heaven? Like, I don't get it. Like, surely there aren't reasonable answers to my intellectual doubts, to the questions that I have. And so for some, it's a stumbling block or an obstacle. The only problem, though, I think with this is that a lot of the people that say, hey, there's no reasonable answers to the questions I'm asking, haven't looked 
for reasonable answers to the questions that they're asking. Yeah, maybe they read a, one book or an article, but do you know how many books and articles have been written by former skeptics, former atheists, former agnostics who didn't believe Jesus was born of a virgin, didn't believe he rose from the dead, didn't believe he's the only way to heaven, but then something happened. They became convinced it was true. They maybe heard some reasonable arguments for why it was true, and they experienced the power and presence of God, and they committed their lives to Christ, and now they're writing a book about it, answering some of the questions maybe you have that have become obstacles for you. I want you to know, God can overturn this obstacle. You just let him. We try to do a series here every, I don't know, every couple of years called FAQ where we just answer questions people are asking. But I'll tell you this, like the first two people that committed their lives to Christ to experience life, and you'll hear about one of them next weekend on the documentary. First two, one was a Jew, the other was a skeptic. You know what their main obstacle was? Intellectual doubt. Once they had some reasonable answers to some of the questions they were asking, and again they experienced the power and presence of God as they came to some of our meetings, both of them committed their lives to Christ. He can overcome the obstacles. Here's another one. Tell me if this is an obstacle for some people you know committing their life to Christ. Maybe for you too. I just want to wait a while. Anybody heard of that before? All of our campuses? I heard a friend. Maybe you've said, well, I just want to wait for a little bit. I heard this a lot in high school on the tennis team. I was on a tennis team. It was amazing. And, uh, and in high school, and I had some friends on there, and I was telling them about Jesus because I was on fire and all that. And I'd say, hey, you guys need to follow Jesus. And they're like, here's the thing. We don't have any intellectual doubts. We don't disagree with you about the Jesus stuff. We just want to what? We just want to wait a while. Like, we're partying it up right now. We like that. And so right now, I kind of like doing things my way. But later in life, because I believe all that stuff about Jesus, later in life, I'll follow Jesus. Only one problem with this. What is it? You don't know how much longer you have. Like, if you don't get right with God today, you might not ever have another opportunity to get right with God. Did you know that? Because here's something you already know. You already know this. We just don't live this way. You and I both already know that today could be our last day. Don't we know that? All of our campuses, how many of you guys know today could be your last day? How many of you guys know that? Every single person knows that. But do we live like that? Not always. I think unless you're living each day like it's your last, you're probably not living each day for the things that matter most. Somebody should tweet that. Facebook, all right? Unless you're, living, unless you're living each day like it's your last, you're probably not living each day for the things that matter most. Isn't that true? Because you know if you had a week left to live, you'd change some things. You'd be like, hey, I, where's my Bible? Okay, week left, all right, Jesus. I mean, you start get, making sure you're right with God. You'd call some friends, get reconciled with them, family members, maybe spend more time with your kids, your spouse. Like you change the way you live because you're living in such a way that you won't have regrets when you pass away seven days from that point or however long it is you've been told that you'll have to live. You're not living each day like it's your last. I guarantee you, you're probably not living each day for the things that matter most in life. You don't know how much longer you have. But yet this is an obstacle for so many people. They don't have intellectual objections. They're just saying, hey, one day, just not today. Here's another one. Tell me if this isn't true. Obstacle for people. Maybe people you know, maybe you coming to faith in Christ. Fear of loss of freedom. Like, okay, here, here's, here's, here's what I'm, I'm afraid of. Is if I put my trust in Jesus, I let God wake me up, I become a follower of Jesus, then I can't do whatever I want to do anymore. Like now I got to do what Jesus wants me to do, and yet I like doing what I want to do, so I'm not too sure about this. And here's what essentially they're saying. They don't say this, but here's what they mean. Hey, here's the thing. I don't want Jesus to be my God. I want to be my God. I like that better. I like being God. I like being able to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it. Who cares what anybody thinks? I don't want to be submissive to anybody. I want to be God. I don't want Jesus to be God. Here, here's the only problem with this. Is freedom, before you put your faith in Christ, is really an illusion. You think you're free. Oh, I can do whatever I want. It's an illusion. You know why? Because the Bible says that you're a slave of what? Sin. Before you commit your life to Christ, the Bible says you're a slave of sin. That ain't, fr that ain't freedom. A slave, a slave to sin? How, how's that going to set you free? Sin destroys your life. You think that you're going to be happy or you pursue happiness and you think it's based on doing whatever you want to do. But you know what the Bible says? That's not where happiness and joy is found. The Bible says that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. That joy, true and lasting joy that you're after and that I'm after is about following the Spirit, following Jesus, not about doing whatever we want to do. And I bet you there's 
I thought I could find a couple thousand people at this church that could tell you that doing things the way you want to do them, and oh, I'm free, and I'm not doing things Jesus' way, I'm doing things my way, it doesn't lead to true happiness. It lead to true and lasting joy. The Bible tells you that. It warns you ahead of time. It isn't found there. It's found in relationship with Jesus as you follow him. Joy, which is what you're after and I'm after, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. This is just an illusion before you commit your life to Christ. But once you commit your life to Christ, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom comes in becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in remaining away from God, from Jesus Christ. We got one more. Another obstacle. God can remove these in your life, your friend's life. Pressure from family members or friends. This was kind of like the false prophet situation, Right? trying to convince the governor, hey, don't listen to those guys. They don't know what they're talking about. Don't follow those guys. Maybe you got a family member or a friend that's telling you, hey, you don't need to follow Jesus. Do that later, man. That's, you know, you'll have no fun anymore. Ruin your life, whatever. My question usually for them would be, how in the world would you know? You got people that aren't following Jesus saying, well, you shouldn't follow Jesus because this, that, and the other. How in the world would they know? They're not, if they're telling you not to follow Jesus, obviously they're not followers of Jesus, all right? So how would they know? And did you know that it's possible for a family member or for a friend to keep you from experiencing all God has for you in this life? Did you know that's possible? It's possible for sure. But that's not true love. Keeping somebody, telling somebody, hey, don't follow Jesus. Hey, don't experience all God has for you. That's not true love. That's not true friendship. And yet I've heard stories before of friends that have said to other friends, hey, you do the Jesus thing. You start following Jesus. We're probably not going to hang out anymore because we're not going to have that much in common. So it's Jesus or me, you know kind of giving them an ultimatum, pressure, or a family member. I've heard of this in families, especially that are of other religions, Muslim family. Heard of a guy that the son had gone to church with a friend, came to the point where he wanted to put his faith in Christ, told his dad. His dad said, you put your faith in Jesus, I'll never speak to you again. Pressure from a family member. What did he decide to do? He decided he wanted to experience all God had for him in this life, and so he put his faith in Jesus, knowing that Jesus could change the heart of his dad. And Jesus could bring his dad to faith in Christ. But he wasn't going to let the pressure from his dad or a pressure, pressure from a friend or whatever keep him from experiencing. And it shouldn't keep you from experiencing all God has for you in this life. Obstacles. But you know what I think the text is saying? Is that God is the ultimate obstacle remover. He's in the business of removing obstacles. And if you're here today and you know you've never been awakened by God, you've never committed your life to Christ, I would challenge you. I would dare you. I'm, here's, 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 here's a dare from a pastor, all right? I would dare you to pray a prayer like this today. A very simple prayer, and I can actually guarantee you God will answer it. You ready? You hadn't committed your life to Christ. You hadn't been awakened by God. I dare you to pray this. Jesus, would you remove the obstacles that are in my life that are keeping me from committing my life to you. Anybody besides me thinks, think that Jesus will answer that prayer? Yeah. Jesus, all I'm asking you to do, there's some obstacles. I got some doubt. I've been, try, I've been thinking I was going to wait till later. I got this family member putting pressure on me. Here's the thing, Jesus. Today, I'm just praying, if you really are a God that removes obstacles, I'm just praying that you'd remove the obstacles in my life today. He will answer that prayer. He will answer that prayer. And if he's already removed the obstacles and you're here and you're so eager saying, man, I want to know him. I want to commit my life to Jesus. I want to, like the governor, I want to become a follower, believer in Jesus. Not a magic formula. Just you simply saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, that means I'm not perfect. Standard for heaven's moral perfection. I can't get there on my own. So Jesus, here's what I've realized. I'm a bad God, Jesus. I'm a bad savior. I've been trying to save myself by being a good enough person. Think that saved me. Standard's perfection. I'm a bad savior. Jesus, I want you to be my God. Jesus, I believe you are God, and I want you to be my Savior. I don't trust in myself anymore. I have nothing to offer you, ultimately. I need you to do something for me because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. If you just say, Jesus, I'm trusting you to save me, not me to save me, he will forgive you, save you, change your life. So we call it committing your life to Christ. If you make that decision today, I hope you'll just check on this card. I'm committing my life to Christ. It's attached to your a program, you take it to the Next Step Center, to any of our campuses, they'll give you a gift to help you in the journey. No more important decision, though, today than that. But if you're not at this place yet, all I ask you to pray, if you've not been awakened by God, not sure about this whole Christianity thing, I just ask you to pray. I dare you to pray. Jesus, would you remove the obstacles? Would you remove the obstacles? Now, for those of you at all of our campuses that have been awakened by God, 
that have committed, you have committed your life to Christ. Here's my challenge for you. I'm also going to challenge you to pray a prayer today, and that is this prayer. Jesus, would you use me in the lives of family members and friends that I have that don't know you to be an obstacle remover? Jesus, would you help me to be an obstacle remover today for those that I know that don't know you? And here's how I think he might use you in that way. Start, you start praying for your family members, hopefully you already are, and friends that don't know Jesus. God, I pray for them that the obstacles would be removed. You have a conversation with them about the obstacles. Hey, what, what is it you think that's keeping you from crossing the line of faith and talking through the obstacles with them? Maybe they'll say the wait a while thing and you can talk with them about it. Maybe it's a resource you can give them, a Bible, a book on a question maybe that they have, maybe written by a former skeptic that's kind of how they are now that's come to faith in Christ and says, hey, here's a reasonable answer. Maybe it's a resource you get them. Maybe you just share with them. This cool story out of Acts 13 about how God is still in the business of removing obstacles. I don't know. All I know is that as a follower of Jesus, and I hope for you as a follower of Jesus, you want to be an obstacle remover for people. You want God to use you in the lives of people you know and love that don't know Jesus to remove obstacles so they might wake them up spiritually. So they might know for sure one day that when they die, they can go straight to heaven. So for those that haven't committed their lives to Christ, Jesus, remove any obstacles in my way. For those that have, Jesus, use me to be an obstacle remover. I want to show you a video. A guy in our church, that there were some, definitely some obstacles in his way, but God removed him. He committed his life to Christ, got awakened by God, and it's a powerful story, so take a look. My parents were missionaries growing up. I grew up in Papua New Guinea for part of my life, and I never really experienced God. Um, that's not to say that, that what my parents were doing wasn't of God, but me personally, I never experienced God. I never, I never went into a church and felt God's presence. Like, whoa, what is that? Something, something's different here. I wanted to believe. I was hungry for God because I knew how empty I was. I was constantly in doubt of the next step, constantly in doubt of pretty much everything in my life. If, if you know, if we were to sum it up with one word, it would be meaningless. You know, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really have a purpose. It's frustrating not knowing why you're feeling the way you're feeling. It was um, constant up and down. You know, I was riding the roller coaster. It was it was nights at the bar. It was it was doing this with friends and doing this with friends that, you know, waking up the next day. Those weren't really friends. You know, the the getting drunk and, and going out and partying was not it was not real fun. It wasn't real fun. It wasn't lasting. Over a period of you know, probably five months, my life spiraled out of control, and uh, you know, I was just down and out. I just got lost the love of my life, uh, probably due to, well, definitely due to to drinking and fighting and doing things, you know, my way instead of God's way. You know, I was just, I was done with living. I, you know, I'd given up hope. You know, I basically, you know, melted down right around New Year's and and uh, swore that I was gonna, you know, wake up the day after New Year's and, and go to church. I don't even know if we had church on, on that Sunday. I don't think we did, but, but I went to Monday night prayer because that was the first thing. I walked in the Southwest campus and it was just me and God. And I was there for one reason. And that was really to confront God and the only place that I knew that I could find God was at Experience Life. I don't remember seeing anybody there that night. You know, it was just me and God, and I, I just basically told God, you know, you know, if you're real, God, and, and I, I've been in and out of church my whole life, and I've been told all these things about God, and, and you know, listen to God, and I, it always frustrated me because, you know, listen, listen to God, what, what makes you better than me that you can hear God and I can't? I think it was due to the fact that, that you know, in order to hear God, you gotta know God. And you gotta get in the Word. And, and I didn't know that at the time. But I told God that night, you know, I, I had all kinds of issues with forgiveness, you know, from my past. I had all kinds of issues coming back from Iraq that, you know, caused me to, to not be able to sleep at night and caused me, you know, just anger, just anger. I just let everything loose that night. And, uh, you know, that, that night I, I told God, I said, you know, I forgive everybody. I just felt God's presence all around me. 
And I just started crying, and and that's when that's when I knew that, and I, and I knew God was real before, but I never really felt His presence. And that's when I invited the Holy Spirit. I was I was like, God, you know, I want to know what the Holy Spirit's like. You know, please, please take over my life. I'm out of control, and I, I want to give all control to You. Since committing my life to Christ, my life has purpose. I have a reason to live, and through, you know. We still, we still face trials, you know, as Christians and, and anybody that thinks that once you commit your life to Christ, then that life gets easier. It doesn't necessarily get easier, but when it, when it gets too much to bear, you, you can always, you know, give it to God. I worry a whole lot less. I, I know, I know what, what the end of the race looks like. And it's, it's a whole lot, it's a whole lot more peaceful knowing that, that you're going to win the race. I think we as human beings have a tendency to take our time with God, take our time with committing our lives to God because, you know, we, we want that that last hire, that last, you know, drunk or, you know, we think that, that giving our life to God, all the fun's over, all the fun stops and, you know, that's not the case at all. I could look back on my life and, and tell you a million different times that, that I did it my way and and I knew it was probably the wrong thing to do, but I didn't care because because I knew I had time to make make things right with God, but that's just not the case. You know, you never know when your last breath is gonna be. Maybe you identify with with Todd and just the way he was talking about, you know knowing about God, but, but lacking a real experience with Him. And that's something, you know, you can't argue with someone is, is something that they've been through personally and they witnessed it. And maybe, maybe you're kind of the same way. You're like, you know, I, I need an experience with Him where, where I, I know that on this day, He, he touched my life. And we, we all chase, you know, we chase things that we think are best and we chase our own plans. Um, but the, the truth about God is that he, he is perfect and his love for us is perfect. His plan for us is the, the best possible thing for us. Like for each one of us, he has, he has a plan and a purpose and, and a destiny in mind. And it's better than anything that you could come up with on your own. But we don't, we don't, want him to interfere because to us Christianity and following Christ means that we have to obey all these rules that kind of suck the fun out of our lives you know and that's just not the case he can't give anything he can't give us anything but his best because that would be contrary to his nature his plan is best and so for you I don't know what your obstacle is maybe Chris touched on him but like he said, it's time to lay that down and ask God to take it from you. Maybe that for you, that means committing your life to Christ. And um, I hope you're, you're making that decision today. Maybe though you're just a believer that's been asleep and it's time for you to wake up and to, to truly follow Christ. Whatever that means for your life. Let go, of, let go of the things that you have stuck in your mind that make you happy and tell God, you know, whatever it is, whatever your plan is, whatever you have for me, I'm down for it because it's, it's best. That's God's best. Like if you want God's best in your life, that requires laying the things that you hold valuable down. And so we have a lot of time left in the service. You know, we're, we're not going to get in a hurry. And, and I just want you guys, you know, to allow God to expose things in your heart that need exposing and allow him to deal with you in that way. Because he knows you better than anyone, right? He knows you better than you know yourself. So let him do his work. Be, be open to him and be willing to go with him. And there's going to be prayer team members at the front. Um, we have these guys every week up here, and, and we don't call them up here just so they can be seen by you. They're here to pray for you. And so if you have a need, even if it's not related to the, you know, the situation, maybe it's just 
something you're dealing with, a sickness or financial need, whatever it is, come up and have them pray with you. Um, maybe you're committing your life to Christ and you want someone just to pray with you or maybe you're just one of those that's asleep at the wheel and you need someone to pray with you. Uh, take advantage of them. But we're going to sing and, and just, we're going to sing about how great God is and how perfect his love is. And we're going to sing about just, a, you know, crying out to God to wake us up. But please make this time uh, about him and about what he wants for your life. God, we, we commit this time to you and, and God, we ask that your truth would trump the lies that the world has been telling us. God, I pray that if there's people here that are just seeking for something and, and they just know there's got to be more than this in life, that you would confront them and just that they would know you and feel you, experience you in a way that they never have before. God, I pray that today would be a life-changing moment in their lives. God, you are good, and your love is perfect. Your love for us is forever. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.